Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to this week's episode of The Flower Lounge, and I'm super stoked to have special guest Frank Buñuelos with us. He is originally from El Paso, Texas, but he lives in Phoenix, Arizona now, and he's been practicing Tai Chi for the last 15 years and one of the most dedicated practitioners that I know, practicing every day. And I've actually known Frank since before he started doing Tai Chi, so I've seen the whole evolution personally myself. And throughout the years, I've practiced with Frank as a teacher and he does a pretty rare style of Tai Chi, very traditional, pre-communism, old style Tai Chi. And so this episode, we're going to share with you all things Chi, Chi flow, Tai Chi, martial arts, how it affects the way you see life and more. So thanks for being with us, Frank. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm really excited. I've always been a fan of podcasts. and Yeah, it's cool. This is so fun. Yeah. So we usually start out with a childhood exercise. So just close your eyes for a sec and go back to your childhood to a time when you played around flowers or plants or trees. And just think about what you were doing and who you were with and see if you can identify a favorite flower or botanical and just reflect about the three words you would use to describe that favorite flower or botanical and then whenever you're ready you can open your eyes and share what you've been thinking about hmm. i already know like as soon as you say like childhood i go to one place so strong rooted and connected yeah what was your favorite oh those three words or what was the plant or the flower or the tree so it's it's a tree and I'm not sure if this is the right name, but this is what my uncle, who's the one who planted it, when we first moved into this house, and it's the house my parents still live at, they called it a Mexican elder. And it grew in our courtyard. And like, it's huge. Like, it's still huge. And actually, I think, sadly, I think they had to cut it down that long ago because it was getting old and sick. But all throughout my childhood growing up, like, you woke up in the morning, you went outside, and there was this area. And it was just this tree that was in the center that like, it was always so strong. Like the smell of it when you went outside, like it smelled like nature, but it smelled like home. Like that was where everything was. And growing up, like that's where we would play or like, you know, we'd go outside and like we had that courtyard, which was a nice separation of like everything else. So it was like just centered and oriented. If we had get togethers, courtyard, that tree was always there. Um, doing all the yard work with my dad things like that with my mom and playing as a kid which is funny enough is I always would imagine myself with like sticks and stuff and like swords and like fighting off, <laughs> fighting off evildoers or <laughs> trying to protect something from somebody or just doing that of course that, <laughs> kind of looking like like a kid just probably like wildly like swinging his arms around sticking his <laughs> <laughs> lost my own imagination <laughs> i love the name mexican elder yeah and again it's i hope that's the name it's it's because that tree is very prominent in el paso which is one of the reasons why it was you know easy to grow there but yeah it just reminds me of family and everything else so the what we find is that the three words you use to describe your favorite would typically describe how you bring your greatest gifts into the world so strong rooted connected, very family oriented, very centered. Does that sound like you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it sounds totally like you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of you as like, it's so funny, the tree's called elder, because I always think of you as like this sort of elder Chinese guy, like inside a Mexican body. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that sums it up right. Even my mom as a young kid, like when I was younger, she would call me an old man. Cause like I was really not into like a lot of things that most younger kids were doing, and and like I was kind of always the one that would like watch things and like before I actually did something. <laughs> even even in my like younger like rebellious age, like I was the one who was like the one that was like they would look to of like 
we're gonna do something crazy and stupid should we do it i'm like mm, no that's like kind of crossing the line like we should not do that we should go do this instead let's, <laughs> let's calm down take it easy yeah yeah, yeah. And speak, speaking of craziness so uh, you know i've known you since before your tai chi days and, and i i didn't know you really well when we, the time but talk a little bit about the you before tai chi like when you're you young before tai chi. So, and how you how you found tai chi well I mean, I, was, I always felt like an outcast, like growing up. Um, it was hard for me to, you know, it wasn't hard for me to make friends. Never hard for me to make friends, but I never felt like I fit anywhere. Like belonged. I belonged. And, and see, that's the thing. Like everybody who I always met or who I always encountered, they're, you know, they're friendly enough and they always allowed you to feel belonged. And I never had that issue, but it, there was always this thing of like, I don't feel like I'm in the right place or like something doesn't feel right. Like there's mm -hmm. something out there. And I think, and like, I didn't actually, I would not allow friends to come over to my house until I was like a teenager. Why? I, was very, I was very protective of who came to my house. Mm. Like to me, it was like, this was, this is my safe haven. Like these people are most important to me. I don't want other people associating with this. I don't want to ruin this. I don't want them to come in and like almost infiltrate it and like maybe cause issues or something like that. And so like, you know, I had friends at school, but once I went home, like it was time with my family, like mm -hmm. going up, time with my dad and my sisters and everything like that. And then around middle school, of course, like most people, like I got into music, which I love music. Like it's a huge staple in my life. And I always wanted to be in a band and like, I knew how to play like really bad guitar, like most. <laughs> uh, and there was a few guys that I knew from like growing up, but they were like the punk rock kids. Yeah. And like, that's kind of the music I was into because it was very like anti-established, like anti-everything pretty much. And again, I think that goes along with the fact that like, I didn't feel like I fit in anywhere. So I found that subculture that was also like, we're also a group of people that don't feel like we fit in. And this is the way that we handle it and we take, you know, we deal with things. And it's kind of like, if you have something you're against about, we don't care, you can be one of us because you don't belong to like the rest of the mainstream the way everybody else is. And these friends came up to me and they were like, hey, you want to be in a band? And I was like, yeah, I do. And that started like me playing in bands and, and doing all that stuff. But being in a punk band and being around certain people who are into not so friendly things you tend to grow up in a different situation like i was playing at bars at the age of 15 and mm -hmm. hanging out with unsavory characters like i made friends with people who had already like served time and and as growing up like they get into really bad drug habits and things like that and again because though i kind of had that elderly old man ideal like it's nothing I got into like I was a part of but like I never put myself in that harm danger and it was more of like I like seeing that side of humanity at the mm -hmm. same time. It, mm -hmm. it, it felt at that point something at least real which going back then it was like all of a side because a lot of these people you know we're going through a lot of stuff and trying to find a way to like deal with it but to me at the same time like I've always had that idea of like wanting to help people and trying to understand like that side of, I guess, suffering and pain. And some of the best ways to do that, or I thought at that age was to like put myself in, in that situation. And, but you know, you grow up and around that and you start to experiment with things. And as I got older, you know, I, you know, I experimented with, you know, drinking and, and the occasional uses of marijuana and, you know, other stuff. And it led me to actually leave El Paso as soon as I graduated. I graduated when I was 17 years old. And the friends that I was in a band with, they were like, hey, we're moving to Phoenix. And one of them was like, I'm going to school here. And I was just like, yeah, get me out of El Paso. <laughs> like, it's time to leave. And so I left. And my parents thought I wasn't going to make it because, again, like, I was a homebody. Mm -hmm. like, out of, just out of high school, never worked a job, anything. Like, there's actually, I think, like a running bid to see who would win of how long it would take me to move back to El Paso. <laughs> <laughs> never went back. Yeah, I never, never went back. Yeah, I think my mom, like, 10 years, like, was it 10 years ago? Like, she finally told me, she's like, yeah, I think we're ready to admit that you're not moving back to El Paso. <laughs> you're pretty much home. I was like, yeah, yeah, pretty much found my place here. But, so yeah, I moved here, and, like, the band kind of disassembled, and we realized that, like, hey, we got to grow up. We have to get jobs. We have to do all this stuff. And right. 
my first job was where I had a record store, you know, selling music. It was what I love. But again, still around the same type of people, people who party a lot, go to shows, you know, do a lot of that stuff. And I found another band, but it was still part of the same thing. And I think around when I was 21 or before I turned 21, like I started to get very sick of that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I, I've always been somebody who also likes, I love learning things, like new things, whatever it is, especially again, if it's anything to hopefully help somebody later on, if it's a skill to learn or a different perspective, I'll take it on. And so I got into like even dieting and I was, I was vegan for like a year, like trying that out just to see how that would go, uh, which didn't pan out for me, you know, personal choice and all that stuff. And around this time, like I had started talking to some friends about meditation. One of the bands that I actually started with was with a guy who was going to school for meditation. We actually, our, our band was the Bodhi tree. Mm-hmm. And it was of, of him, who was somebody who had studied Eastern philosophy and religion. Me, this kid who was like, decided to go straight edge, like not do any of the stuff, but still wanted to help people. And an ex uh, heroin junkie who was in the same uh, idea of like, let's do something where we can help people. We like playing music. We mesh really well together. Let's do this. And with the help of this one friend, Mike, he was like, hey, dude, talking to you is like reading from this book about about meditation and Buddhism. He's like, have you ever gotten into this? I was like, I have heard things like I've read little like snippets here and there. And he's like, well, let me give you some literature, see what it is and, you know, see if you like it. And I would read it and we would talk about stuff and how like it really correlated to like something that I was looking for that was kind of like honing in on something. And then another friend that I met, which is actually the way I met you, she was also getting into meditation and she was like, hey, I know some people that you would probably really like to meet. And, and it took me a while, like, cause like I was, it, it was like exciting and scary at the same time. And it was like, like something that I had always wanted, but at the same time, like, because it was like right in front of me, it was like a little bit scary to like reach out and grasp. Mm-hmm. And so she would always be like, oh, they ask about you. They want to meet you. And in me, I was like, that's awesome. And then also like the younger kid in me was like, ah, like I didn't know what to do. <laughs> And I think it took like three months where I finally got the nerve and, you know, I went over and I was actually on, it was the day before my birthday. I remember that. Yeah, it was the day before my birthday. I met all of you guys and we actually, you guys taught me how to meditate because I had tried meditating as, you know, from these books because I didn't really know anybody. And we, I think we started like at 10 o'clock at night and the meditation ended at three o'clock in the morning and like it was cloudy. It started sprinkling around the time when we were asking about each other, like what we you know, expected to have of ourselves, of our higher selves, what we wanted to do for people. And like, I felt that was like one of the only, or like one of the first times I felt like home, like it felt right. There's all these people that like, were kind of in the same mindset of like wanting to do good things, wanting to help people. And like, as soon as everybody had that like affirmation, like, again, it was, it was strange because like the clouds cleared a little bit enough for you to see a lot of the night sky and some of the stars that you can see, especially in Phoenix, but then it started to sprinkle, especially on a hot night of July. And it was like, it was like so like magical at the same time and like eye opening. It was like, cool. Like I found it. Like I found what I've been looking for. This is great. And like, ever since then, like a lot of doors have opened for me, which is you know amazing. Mm. But, yeah. But it was kind of like living a young, a young lifestyle of debauchery. (laughs) (laughs) That kind of helped me get to this point. (laughs) So, how did you get into Tai Chi, and how did the meditation did that like lead you into Tai Chi, or how did that happen? I had been like studying meditation, and I had taken refuge as well. And you know, our fellow teachers, uh, Sangye, very you know influential on everything I did, and. Like almost from right from the moment, it was like, like, I got to listen to this guy. Like if he tells me something, I got to do it. And so like, as I started meditating, he started telling me a lot of things like, <laughs> like, you got to lose weight or you got to get a better job. Cause I was working at a record store. He's like, you got to get like, you got to grow up. You got to get a job and all that stuff. And, and I remember the first time that he did that to me, I had dinner at, you know, I had dinner with him and then I was so shocked and nobody had ever like just straightforward like done that to me and like it hit me 
And I think Olga gave me that look of like, oh great, we, you know, he's scared away. He's not, he's not going to want to, you know, be a part of this anymore. And I didn't have a car at that time. And I walked home and it was like a three hour walk home. And it was like, cause I was just like, I have to think about stuff. And like, my mind was like, it felt fractured, but in a good way. It was like, somebody had like punched this landscape that I had. And I was able to see things in, in a different uh, perception. And I was able to see the different uh, pieces of things, the choices that I made. And I was walking home that day. Like I started to slowly piece these things back together of like, okay, well, this is the next step I need to do. This is the next step. This is the next step I need to do. And I actually didn't go back to that. I didn't go back uh, for like, I think it was like a year. I don't know if you remember that. Like, wow. yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a while. I, and don't I, I wanted that. to, I wanted to, you know, if I was going to come back, I want to be like, you know, I listened, I did this, I worked hard, I want to be better. Like when I come back, I want to show, you know, these people who I felt such a strong connection to that, like, I am willing to do this, like, I want to do this. And like, not just for me, but to hopefully like help other people along the way. And so I got a new job, I moved into my old place. And everything was going like, I was starting to make like money where I could save up money and like start doing things with it, which at the time, like, I was such a recluse, like I lived in a two it was like a two bedroom apartment that i got really cheaply but since i had nothing like one room was just like empty and i was like <laughs> it would become my practice which was really funny because if anybody walked by my apartment they probably thought like some weirdo was living there because like you could tell somebody was going in and out but you would look in the windows and there was like no furniture <laughs> everything in the back in my room which was like <laughs> books and like <laughs> that was it. like my cd collection and that was all i had <laughs> but then when I so I finally went back and during this time of having this space though one of the things and I was still in a band and Mike had become like very close to me like family and during this time he actually had met his wife and was about to have a kid which is one of the reasons why I had to move out and he even pulled me aside he's like listen like we love having you around uh we know you're like working on stuff but you know have a kid coming soon and I don't, he, and he was like really trying not to make it where I was like, no, I, dude, I totally understand. Like, you know, I love you guys and uh, I want to be there for you as much as possible, but like, you're doing your own thing now. Like everybody's moving on and like, and that's, that's great. That's awesome. And so during, you know, this movement stuff of like kind of separating him, getting his own life, um, me getting my life, we kind of knew that our time together was going to become very separate. So we tried to spend as much time as we could together. And one of the things that he was like, Hey, like you're really in a boom. That's cool. He's like, something I've never shown you is like do you like kung fu movies and I was like I've like seen some in the past I've never got into them he's like well, let's uh he's like let's watch one of my favorite kung fu movies which was well it's called Shaolin Master Killer in America but mm -hmm. the real name is the 36 Chambers of Shaolin starring uh Gordon Liu and so you know going into it I had no idea like I've never watched a kung fu movie forward and back all I knew from it was a kid of like oh it's that movie where they fight and the dubbing is so off where like <laughs> like it's like hey you over there and like the mouth is like still moving like, the um, dubbing is so bad dubbing, oh, it is, it, outlawed. It, dubbing should be outlawed it should it really should there is a the nuance is the way to go there is a nuance to listening to it and like reading the subtitles and like all that stuff that like adds so much to the the enjoyment of the movie and that's how he wanted to watch it he was like we're not going to watch it with the subtitles like we're going to watch it or no, we're not going to watch it with the dubbing. We're going to watch it with the subtitles. Right. And so we started watching it, and like I, I fell in love. And it's a story of this guy who wants to become a monk to revenge his family, and he ends up like going through the whole thing of training that the Shaolins have to do, and learning his style, mastering a style, and then creating his own style, and then getting to that point where like he can avenge. But instead, he chooses to stay at Shaolin, and when they ask him... Let me interrupt you. For for the listeners who don't know what Shaolin is, what the heck is Shaolin? Yeah. Do you want me to explain what Shaolin yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. What is Shaolin? So Shaolin, Shaolin, there's a... Shaolin is a Buddhist monastery in China. And there is actually a few... There's like a north, a south, and an east, and a west. And right now, there's just a northern school. And before, it was, it was a... It was a, an expansion of uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And at some point, a teacher came by. His name was Bodhidharma, or as they know him as Dhammo. And he taught them a lot of new meditations, as well as how to protect themselves against thieves and stuff like that. And there's a huge story in that, which at some point we will 
hopefully go through later. But through his teachings, they were able to all become healthy, to understand their body through like physical movie meditation, as well as learn how to protect themselves with fighting, which became uh, Shaolin martial arts. And so a lot of the martial arts people see now, especially in movies, came from Shaolin. A lot of them did. It was these this introduction, because when he taught them these fighting moves, they took these fighting moves and like they would watch animals and how they would move and how they would defend themselves. And so you get like, you know, the tiger stance and you get monkey stance, tiger crane, which actually even goes back to Tai Chi because it said that he had two scrolls that he would not let, like nobody was ready to learn these two scrolls yet. One of them being what became Tai Chi, which was later given on to a monk named uh, Chang Song Feng. And the other one is still lost, supposedly. Wait, this is in the movie? No, this is history. Like, this, this is, is not a movie. This is like the history of Shaolin. Like, got it. Okay. Like, this is this is like kind of like the more of the history of like Tai Chi and how Tai Chi came into Shaolin and how how it was re realized. But yeah, so there's these two scrolls. One of them was given, and this was you know the foundation for Tai Chi. The other scroll still lost. Nobody knows where it is, and so that's been going on. But so. Shaolin, you know, thus was created. Well, it's been there for a while, but the idea of like Chinese martial arts in Shaolin came from Dhamma. And so there's a long history of Chinese martial arts. And people usually, when they know, think of Shaolin, they think of the Chinese martial arts, forgetting that like Shaolin martial arts or Chinese martial arts are only taught to about like 20 to 30 percent of the monks. Like they were pretty much just there to like meditate and be regular like Buddhist practitioners, like only a small few, usually only those who needed the discipline of, of physical martial arts. Cause there's some people who can't sit all day mm-hmm. and sit like, you know, even for 15 minutes and they need something else to kind of help them focus their mindset. When I was in my early twenties, I, I used to like tool around on the internet and look at like, try to find the real Shaolin places and yeah. I found one and I was like, gonna go. Like, I don't know if I ever told you that, but yeah, I was like really obsessed for, for a few months about going to China. Going, selling everything and just leaving. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't go. Yeah, I had, well, I had that same thing. And so, so going back to this movie and watching this story, yeah, old, like it, it like ignited something in me again. And it was like, yeah. like, like you did, like, I want to do this. Like, and I, I did the same thing. Like I, I went to libraries because around this time, like there's internet wasn't, you know, it wasn't as easily right, accessible, right, especially right. for somebody like me. Like I had no money. I didn't have a computer. I didn't have the internet. <laughs> I could go to the library, but it was like, eh, go to the library for that. Nah, I'll go like look up on books and stuff like that. And, and I found like my plan was to go to Shaolin and I found some books on training. And so I started like practicing my horse stance. Like I made makeshift equipment and was practicing like regular punches or like their standard punches, like, you know, all the prerequisites and stuff like that. And. Oh my God. Um, Cause they're so badass, right? Like you, like, oh yeah. like when they, they have all those, like, <clears throat> I mean, and this is not really the point of martial arts, but like to just to show the strength of the chi, like those huge, like tree trunks like going into their bellies or like laying on a bed of nails or like crazy crazy stuff yeah. to or show like them. somebody puts a, a spear against their throat and the guy breaks it like with the point digging right into it using just the leverage of his body on the ground like and it's just the control of the body and again like that's that's just a right. show of right. what the practice right. does. like they right. have such control of their chi their energy their awareness like this is what they can do and, you know, and a lot of that is just made to like, hopefully get people to be like, like us to be like, That's awesome. like <laughs> let's go to China, let's go to China, let's go to Shaolin, let's learn this stuff. And so like, I, I had been like, I was saving money, I was selling like my record collection, which like, like that was my prized possession at that time. <laughs> You're like fantasizing about the moment in Kill Bill when you can't even hold up your chopsticks. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. Like when everything's sore, like my body's beaten. <laughs> Still just trying to get like the admiration from my teacher, like... <laughs> Like, good job. Like, yes, I'm doing it. But so, like, I was getting ready to go, and that's when I went back, and I I got a call from one of our other friends, Lisa, and she was like, hey, haven't seen you in a while. (laughs) You should come by again. And so I was like, cool. I feel I'm ready. So I went, you know, met with Songa, and I'm telling you, I'm so excited to tell him, like, hey, I got a new job. Like, I'm doing all this stuff. Like, I felt really great. And and I was like, and I want to go to Shaolin. Like, 
I figured like, this is what I want to do. It seems like it's right for me. Like I've been training. It feels so good. I found, you know, if I can't go to China, I found that there's a sister temple in Portland, Oregon. And I think I know some people where they might let me stay for a little bit. And again, like he looked at me and like just shattered everything. He looked at me and he was like, you're too fat, you're too old, and your feet are too flat. They will never take you. Oh. And he was like, my brother was in Shaolin. He's like, I had a brother who was in Shaolin. He looked at me, he's like, they will never take you. And like right then, like, Ouch. like if you, I'm sure if you watched like the color drained from my face and I was just like, again, sitting there again, everything shattered. And then uh, like, it felt like an eternity of silence went by, but I'm sure it was like five seconds. And then he <laughs> turned to me and he was like, do you know what Tai Chi is? And I was like, I've heard of it. I don't really know. And I was like, I've seen like old people like doing that thing. In the <laughs> he's like, he was like, yeah, it's, that's kind of, he's like, you should look into what uh, tai, tai Chi is or Tai Chi. And he even said, you need to look up Tai Chi Chuan. You need to know what it means. You need to understand what the difference between that is and what everybody else practices. Once you understand that, you need to find a teacher who teaches this and who is really good at it. And he's like, and do that. He's like, and see, and of course, see how you like it. And I was like, okay. And then of course, like, again, from that first, that first time where everything was rattled and everything was like piecing back together, I was like, okay, I will look up everything. I got every book I could, uh, asking as many people as I can about Taiji Chuan. And I'm not, a lot of people here didn't like know the difference at that time. The only people who did, they were, they were actually like, they were Chinese martial art practitioners. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh yeah. And, I, and, but a lot of them were like, but we do, you know, the 24 short form and we do like, or like the 48 long form or we do chin. And they would look at me, they're like, what you're asking for is like an older style. Like you're mm -hmm. looking for an old teacher. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, you know, well, we don't teach that. Like we yeah. learn this. And so I'm still looking around this time. Like I had moved out of my friend Mike's house. I moved into a new apartment, that one place. And, you know, been looking for a teacher. And I was almost at, like at the end, like I was like, okay, I feel like I might need to leave. Like, I feel I might need to go somewhere where I can find a teacher who teaches this. And again, I was kind of at that point of view. It's like, I may have to pack up and leave to find this. And it was time for my weekly grocery shopping and I'm coming down the stairs and, mm -hmm. and I look across the parking lot and I see two older white men coming. Now, I, and I lived in a, in a very <laughs> like urban area of Phoenix, uh -huh. uh, which is why I was able to get this place so cheap. And I see these two bald white men walking <laughs> with what looked like they had sticks in their hands. <laughs> And they, they had this certain walk of like control and like power to them. And in my head, I'm like, oh, great. The area nation has moved. <laughs> it was like a joke I made to myself. And like, I made it in passing out. And like, I'm kind of just watching them. And they're both, and this is the thing, they're both wearing like black shirts and brown pants. And like, that's all I could see. And like, it's, I've seen it before. Like, that's a uniform. Like, like they're on patrol. And so oh, I'm Jesus. like, okay. I was like, either way, get my car, go to my grocery shop. <laughs> come back, taking my groceries out, and I see them coming back, but now as I see them coming back, yeah, I see what they have in their hands are actually wooden Chinese swords. Mm. And, and to me, it's like, oh, oh, they do martial arts. Like, I got excited, and so, yeah. like, yeah. like I kind of, like, dropped my, like, I dropped my groceries. I was like, oh, no, 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 like, put them back in my car, like, lock up my car, and, like, I run <laughs> over, and so there's two of them. One's really tall, and one's, like, one's about my height, and I'm, like, about five, six. The yeah. other one, is like about six three, so he's like substantially taller. Yeah. And, excuse me, gentlemen. Um, do you, I see that you have Chinese wooden swords? Do you practice martial arts by chance? Yeah. And the little one, uh, the, or the smaller one, was like, Yeah, yeah, we uh, we practice. We do Chinese martial arts. I was like, I'm looking for a teacher, and a, a, I was like, you know, a certain teacher, and I was just curious of what you guys practice. Mm -hmm. And they were very. Like, they didn't want to talk to me about what they did. Kind like, of. guarded? Yeah, they're very guarded. And the taller one would not even make eye contact with me. He, he was looking down the parking lot, like, I'm ready for this conversation to be over. I'm ready oh. to go back home. Oh. And, and so the, 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 the little one was like, so uh, he's like, well, what, are you, what, what martial art are you looking for? And I looked at him, and I was like, I am looking for a Tai Chi Chuan teacher who teaches mm -hmm. that form. And that's when the big one turned around <laughs> and he looked at me and he had sunglasses on 
And he kept his sunglasses on the whole time, which was, it's a little intimidating when you can't see somebody's eyes <laughs> and the seriousness of them. And especially who it was, because he ended up being my teacher, Gary, Gary Kukuk, which you met him before. So you know how he oh, has yeah. a certain voice, like very, it's like light coming yeah. down from the mountain sometimes. And he was like, <laughs> what did you say, young man? <laughs> it was like, uh, <laughs> I'm looking for a IG1 teacher. And he was like, where did you learn that? Like, where did you learn how to, like, do you know what that means? And I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's Tai Chi, but it's the traditional form. He's like, do you know what that means though? I was like, it translates into grand ultimate fist. And it's the idea of taking the slow form, but actually it's a fighting art and taking the idea of being soft and hard and being balanced and learning in a way where it's, it's not just, it's a meditation, but it's also a fighting art, but it's so much more. And then he, he looked down and he kind of, like he was thinking, he like kind of shook his head. He rubbed his bald head and, <laughs> and he, he looked at me and through those glasses, he's like, well, he's like, I know Tai Chi Chuan. I know the style that you're talking about. And like my heart like started jumping and it was like, oh, oh, like this is it. Like I found him, I found him. And then the next thing out of his mouth was, and I haven't taught for 10 years and I have, and I never plan, I don't plan on teaching. Anymore. Oh, and again, I was like, uh, oh, and I was like, well, do you know anybody who like teaches your form? And and he's like, well, Santa Barbara, like that's where like all my old classmates are. And so, like in my head, I'm already starting to calculate. It's like, okay, maybe if I move to Santa Barbara, like I, I can, you know, do something and like find a place to live. And and then he looked at me <laughs> and he was like, where do you live? And I said, I live in these apartment complexes. I live right over there. He's like, oh, you live right across the parking lot from me. I was like, yeah. And he's like, well, this is Charles. This is an old friend of mine. The only reason I teach him is because he's my oldest friend. And he's he's the only person I teach. He's like, I don't even go by, by Sifu. I don't go by master. I just teach him Tai Chi. And I was like, oh, I was like, well, that's very kind of you. Like, I'm glad at least you're able to still teach somebody. And then he's like, when do you get off of work? And I said, I get off of work at four. And he's like, well, when do you get home? I was like, I get home like around 4.30. And so we turned to Charles. Charles, can you change your practice time to 4.30? And Charles looked at him. He's like, yeah, that sounds easy. I can do that. And so he looked at me. He's like, we meet at the tennis courts. Now we meet at 4.30 Tuesdays and Thursdays. And he's like, you want to start? You're there at 4.30. You're not there a minute late. You can be there early, but you are there. And like, I got so happy. Like, I was like, so excited. I was, like, I was like, let me give you my number. So that way, like, if anything happens, and he was like, no. he was like, no, no, no. You take my number. I don't care about your number. Oh, the geez. reason that you call me is if you can't make it. He's like, because any other reason for you not showing up means that you shouldn't even be being taught by me. You will be there or you will call me and let me know. And so, like, I gave him my name. He's like, okay. And then, and he's like, yep. And you be there this time. And he's like, two less. your first two lessons are free. And I was like, well, thank you so much. Like, that's so great. Uh, and he's like, the reason I'm doing that is, like, I want to see if you're teachable. He's like, yeah. I don't have the time to waste. Right. And he's like, within these two lessons, I will know if you should be my student. So show up, and we'll see what happens. And luckily, I had been practicing my horse stance for so long, so I showed up <laughs> every day and like go through the, the basic warm ups. And he's like, "Okay, I'm going to teach Charles now his lesson." And he's like, "Tell you what, let's see your horse stance. Let's see how well you can stand in horse stance." And so he's teaching Charles, and he's having a hard time with Charles, and because Charles is uh, very stiff and very hard. And it was nice to see Gary like kind of like give it to Charles of like, "No, like this," because to me it was like, "No, this is somebody who cares." Right. Like, very persistent about the form being right and I'm just watching him and I'm in horse stance and I know it took longer than he thought but I'm still in horse stance and he comes over and it's been like 15 minutes he's like okay well let's start with this and he's looking at my legs and he's like have you been in horse stance this whole time and I was like yes he's like, <laughs> you're gonna do pretty good I was like awesome <laughs> and then from then it was it was like I learned very quickly and he was he became excited to teach me Wait, yeah. wait, wait, let's just rewind here. Just in case the listeners are like, what the hell is horse stance? Your knees are bent. It's like you're on top of a horse and yeah, you're yeah. like, after a while, your legs start to shake. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's a great exercise for anybody. Shoulder length, like your feet are shoulder length apart. Of course you're standing up, you bend your knees, you know, 
so that your knees don't go past your toes. You want to suck in your butt. You want to relax your shoulders, but keep everything <laughs> And it sounds easy, but like standing in it, even for like five minutes when you're not used to it, right. even for right. people who I, I've taught people who were runners, who were even personal trainers that like getting into horse dance for them and keeping it, they're like, what is this? And it's like, this is teaching your your legs to stand in a way and your muscles to work in a way you never thought that that they would get tired of. Like it's it's so great. And it's just like a it's a very beneficial stance, even for a standing meditation. But again, me doing that, like it, like he saw that. Clearly, you wanted him as your teacher. Clearly, clearly I did. And and I made sure too that like, and he taught see, here's the thing, like he taught me traditional. And in a lot of schools, they will They'll, they'll like teach you like a few moves at once. Mm-hmm. Or like they'll have these exercises which help you lead into the moves and it's kind of like, you know, a really quick setting. And that's understandable because you have a lot of turnover rate. Sometimes not everybody's there at the same lesson. When I was with Gary and I, after a month of time of being taught traditional, which means that you're taught one move and you have to learn that move. You have to perfect that move for a beginner. And you have to get the handstand right. The breath has to be right. The positioning of the body. When you shift and move into the second part of the position, everything has to be well-connected, well-coordinated. Once you get that, then he taught me the next move. Mm -hmm. And so my practice, like, even though he would have teach me this one thing where it, like, in reality would take, like, two seconds to do, Mm -hmm. I would go home and I would practice for, like, an hour just Mm -hmm. as and so the next time he showed me, he'd be like, you got it, next one. And like, that just kind of helped me progress and, and so forth. Where like a lot of places, like they don't have that traditional style of teaching. Mm-hmm. And again, it's understandable. They want to, they want people to do the movements and the movements of Tai Chi, like very beneficial, even if you're not doing martial, but I wanted to learn everything, like everything Gary had to offer. I wanted to learn. Well, let me ask you too, because, you know, I'm sure people are curious, like, how is it possible that you ran into this white guy who knew of this super old traditional style of Tai Chi that's almost hidden and secret. How did he, how did he find it? Like, let's talk about lineage and the importance of lineage. Okay. So he, Gary, Gary has a sort of past and like, I'm going to be honest, like probably doesn't want some of it being out online, but we'll, we'll go back to when he, so he, he was a young guy and he, when he was a young guy, he loved fighting as well. And he actually knew a lot of different martial arts and he was in the military. He was in the army part of the Vietnam War and he did go AWOL and actually that started his journey because he started in Japan and then made his way to Switzerland and then ultimately made his way back to America and along this way uh, over all his travels he still had the idea of like I want to be a fighter I want to be a fighter Mm -hmm. and while traveling he heard the you know the the mention of there's this thing called the grand ultimate fist Tai Chi Chuan or if you Mm -hmm. master like the, the best thing ever and so when he finally landed back in America he would thought that okay, I'll find I'll find a, a martial art teacher. Maybe I'll find this this mystical martial art that I've heard so much about from my travels in the East. And he did. He found a guy by the name of Ni Fu Young, Master Ni Fu Young, Sifu Ni Fu Young, that was teaching a very small group, and it was kind of like only by invitation. Mm-hmm. Like you had to know somebody who knew somebody. And that if you had already been trained in martial arts and you kind of had this mentality of like, you know, meditative, soft, he was teaching this. And Master Ni was at that time, this was like back in the 70s, like late 70s, very secretive about his form of Tai Chi. Now, around this time, too, is when Tai Chi was becoming popular in the United States. But the form that was being taught was again the 24 short form or the chin style form and there's a lot of separation like you know that there's a qigong style or the bakwa jia and and for the listeners all these are just different forms of of internal art that uses you know a lot of smooth body movements to gather up your chi to move it out to make you healthy now the traditional form of tai chi though from what i was taught and what from master ni taught uh and what gary taught should combine all these things together but in order to incorporate these things all together, you need to incorporate the martial aspect of this. And this is why Master Ni was afraid of actually letting too many people know what he was teaching because during the revolution of China, when the communists were taken over, this form of Tai Chi was usually only taught to like the elite guardsmen mm-hmm. or, or high up monks. And 
Now, Tai Chi is not just a martial art. It's not just a meditation thing. It's, it's a way of life. And the best way that Gary put it to me is that we are not just, we use the term Tai Chi fighter, but we are, we are defenders and we are protectors of everything beautiful in this world. Because mm-hmm. Tai Chi teaches you how to respect life, how to respect everything. And especially what was going on in China around that time, to have a dictatorship was not really lined up with the way of Tai Chi. And, and a lot of them knew that. And they started killing off a lot of Tai Chi masters. And they would oh. hunt them down and they would try to get rid of them. And so a lot of them went into exile, the ones who survived. Mm-hmm. One of them was Master Ni. He, he, he went to Taiwan mm-hmm. and then after being in Taiwan. And he was still a little bit afraid of like the Tong from what right. I heard. Stories that Gary has told me. Uh, and so he made his way to California, Santa Barbara. And, you know, and, and it's understandable that anybody who wants to teach or who knows this, you want people to learn. So I imagine like he still wanted people to learn this art. But, you know, finding the people and also you know, like, still being a little bit worried about it. So he found a few students and Gary was one of them. Mm -hmm. But at first, like, he was very like, do not tell anybody. (laughs) Like, if people come around, like, invite them. We don't tell them what we do. We'll see. uh, Let me see how they are. And then if I want them as a student, I'll keep them. Right. And and Gary became his number one student. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gary learned everything. Gary kind of did what I did where, like, he he got a, a, a job to make enough money, but all his money went into school. And he took morning, night, morning, afternoon, and night classes for Master Knee. Wow. He would work nights. Wow. And between the times that he wasn't practicing or working, that's when he would sleep. Oh, and my God. A security guard at a YMCA, and they let him park his VW van in the parking lot, and that's where he slept, and he would use their showers and then, wow. and then be the security guard at night, and when he wasn't doing that, he was doing his practice. Wow. Yeah, like he, he had that same mentality of like, I want to learn. Everything. Whatever it takes whatever it takes. And he became his number one. And then, you know, would teach people here and there. And then once Master Nee retired, like in, I think it was like the late nineties, you know, Gary was, was also, that was around the time that he didn't want to teach anymore. And he came to feed mm-hmm. him, you know, mm-hmm. met up with Charles again. And, and it's that idea. He's like, it's hard to find students who want to learn this form. It's a very hard form to learn. And Gary was also more into the martial aspect, more into the meditative. Gary was very much like, I want to learn the fighting aspect. But mm-hmm. he also told me, he's like, but because I did choose Tai Chi, it calmed me down. And it made mm-hmm. me realize, and something that he imparted on me and something that he always would tell me, because he, he was training me to be a fighter. He was like, there will always be somebody better than you. He's like, the person looking to vanquish, completely vanquish, will easily become vanquished. He's like, that's why you need to understand that you are a protector or a defender. A protector and a defender only needs to survive or to make sure everybody's taken care of, that they survive. He's like, once you do that, you will always survive. You will always find a way to stay. He's like, if you are looking to vanquish completely, you will Vanquish, you mean to be aggressive against someone else? Aggressive, yeah, aggressive. To have that idea of like, I'm going to go out and just like pound people and like become the top. And he's like, because he's like, first of all, you will, that's your weakness there. Like your, Mm -hmm. your ego will come into, and like that will ultimately tear you down. He's like, the other part of that is there will always be somebody better than you. Right. Like you think you're the best now. And that may be true for like a split second, but then there's somebody better that will come along. And he's like, and if your mindset isn't geared in like, I still want to be the best and somebody better comes along and you challenge them, he's like, you will get beaten horribly. Mm-hmm. He's like, you need to change your mindset. You can't think that like, I'm going to be the best fighter there is. I'm going to go out there and just like run into fights. He's like, you can't do that. So Tai Chi Chuan can be really is more like an art of self-defense in a sense, even though yeah. it can be used as an ag- aggressive fighting style. It can be, yeah. It can be both. And that's and that's the idea of Tai Chi is that you learn to balance yourself, you learn to be natural, you learn not just self-defense, but self-protection. Self-protection is the idea of being aware of your surrounding, not letting yourself be put into situations that you can't control or that you don't know how to handle a certain situation. And so it teaches you, yes, how to defend yourself, but in the instance that you need to actually really put more effort into it you can do that as well. So how, how, I mean, I think, you know, probably a lot of people have seen, you know, the super micro, slow moving groups of people in the parks. I mean, I know 
like especially when I was in Asia, I would see, um, you know, groups of people doing Tai Chi in the park. And it's difficult to see that and then conceive that this can actually be a fighting style. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, like of how it correlates more into a fighting style. Well, so the slow aspect of Tai Chi is very important. I, I don't want to downplay that at all. Um, and it's beautiful seeing those groups of people doing it. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And this, the slow aspect is to gather chi, I'm going to say, and uh, develop awareness. And develop awareness, gather chi. It's also very good for the body. It's a good exercise. Uh, it's, it helps to really stretch out all the muscles, all the bones, the ligaments, the joints, the certain movements that are done in Tai Chi. And the reason that they are so important, especially like in the way you do them, is that whatever is happening on the outside of the body is happening internally energy wise and also physically wise so your your organs are also rolling together they're slowly pushing up and massaging each other they're opening up these meridian lines allowing that chi flow to really permeate to balance out to also dislodge any imbalance that the body may have and again so like doing it slow is very important i've also heard you talk about that it strengthens the bones. This be a good practice for people who have, say, like weak bones or for women getting older or people who have osteoporosis in their family? Yes, and because the bone is a living thing. The bone is like, you know, some people consider the bone like it's just hard thing. It's, it's empty, <laughs> it's narrow inside. Their cells, it, it replenishes the whole time. And as you get older, it does start to decay. It does start to get older. When you do the form, it actually allows the chi flow to permeate the bone. And when it permeates the bone, of course, chi, it's, it's life force. It's energy. Everything has it. It's energy. Everything has energy. And so what you're doing, you're learning to cultivate this and actually kind of rejoin that natural life force and reopening your body to it. And so energy-wise, it's permeating the bone and it's kind of reactivating like the marrow, the cells inside, and kind of giving them that boost of like, hey, everything's still active here. Like, it's okay, you know, to grow new cells and be young and and work together and so by that it actually it strengthens the bones at the same time the muscles on the outside learn to work together with the joints and the tendons and everything starts to adhere at once so now you instead of just having like the bone and then the muscle on top of it the sinews the joints and the ligaments they're all starting to fuse together with these practices and then having, you're pretty much creating a clear connection for the chi flow to join together, to flow, to permeate these bones and to make the, the bone stronger. And also because you're not just like getting rid of stagnancies and opening your flow, you're doing that, but you're also, right, pulling up chi from the earth, which for like the other flower essence freaks out there, people who love flower essences, it's almost like, like a martial movement where you're like literally in the form absorbing what would be like flower essences or plant or earth essences up through your feet into your body, right? Yes, yes, that's correct, yeah. As you're doing it, like everything is being drawn up. You learn how to, and that's why the importance of horse stance is so amazing because it's not just for the body, but as you practice this breathing, you understand of drawing the energy up from your feet into your lower chakra point up through the rest of the body and then it permeates out and as it's expanding it's not like it's just you know this well that as soon as like it blows out that's it it's this continuous flow to where once you get into that flow and that movement it's not just through the feet that the chi is now coming your whole body is becoming this conduit of chi coming in and chi flowing out and you understand that through your body like you are a reflection of the world around you, not just Mother Earth, but also everything on it. You contain the earth matter in you. You contain the water element. You contain you, know, you contain the wind, the fire, all that is in you. Mm -hmm. and, you know, depending on what you're doing, and again, that's why the chi flow or the chi uh, tai chi in such a slow movement is very important because it helps you to understand this, and this is very crucial to understanding what of course tai chi is really is is that as you do these slow motions like you understand that like your feet are grounded like the mountain your trees move like the wood and they bend and they sway the the river your blood flows like the river that heat that's generating is the fire your arms move like the wind and at any point you can change it 
your your hand can become as as hard as steel but also as light as cotton at the same time it's all there it's all together all at the same time and that is a prerequisite to learning how to do it fast because when it's fast and you actually learn that within these small movements there's also grapples there's punches there's leg movements and you've seen some of the the different leg stances that I have and like it's quick movement it's not that slow stance like it's mm -hmm. learning how to reposition the body and that's when you incorporate of course like uh, more bakwaja and like qigong and qingi into it and that's when it really turns into a fighting art now the art that everybody does in the park the slow motion one that is still a very great self-defense and it's very like standing the energy is coming to you and you learn how to move the energy and that's another thing you're learning how to move energy not take it into the body, displace it, transform it. Okay, let me interrupt you there. So, can Tai Chi help then with? So let's say, um, let's say, let's say somebody like isn't even interested at all in the martial aspect. They're like, I, I don't even, I'm not even interested in fighting, mm -hmm. but I have this really stressful job, and people are like giving me all this negative energy all day, and I just want to be able to know how to not take on that energy and filter it, funnel it in a different direction. Can the practice of Tai Chi help with that? Most, most definitely. And, and again, since Tai Chi is a balance, like not only is it a practice in the physical martial and in the energy sense, but it's also in what we call the civil, the way you, you are out in the way of life and the way you interpret and you are the way you handle people and experiences like that, especially like emotionally, things like that. And it's the same way because the way one thing is done in Tai Chi is kind of the way it's done in everything. It's just a reflection of it. So you learn how like people are giving negative energy you will learn to, okay, first you interpret of what it is, you know, becoming a, you know, somebody who does Tai Chi, you learn not to actually like faint away from those things. You learn to move it, displace it, use it, understand also where this is coming from, from the other person. So it, it it's also a very good lesson in empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, like what's, when somebody is projecting something like that at you, it has to come from somewhere. Right. It's not just this thing that like all of a sudden they're like, oh, I'm angry, but like, no, it's coming from somewhere. Right, right. So either in your speak or the way you handle it, you can even take in their energy, understand what it is and let it become a part of you for mm -hmm. a little bit, Ch change it. Mm -hmm. And then you can send it back out. Now, mm -hmm. when sending it back out, it's either going to, you know, you're going to send it back out as a positive thing, whether it's to somebody else that you can help somewhere else on the road or to that person who has given it to you. And it's going to hit them hard. And it is actually going to allow them to hopefully change something that they see in their head based on what they gave you. And that's even the way the fighting art works. Somebody gives you something hard, something tremendous. The form teaches you to accept it, take it in, change it around, flip it, and then give it back to them harder. And it's the intention of that other person and also your intention. That's why they say imagination in Tai Chi is very important. It's the idea to take these ideas and the imagination is helping with the body control, the awareness to change these things. And so that way, you know, when something like that, like a serious, hard situation comes, it allows you to use your imagination combined with empathy to be like, okay, maybe this person is feeling this. Let's see where they're going through. Let's take it in. How would I feel about it? How would I change it? And how can I re-give it out so that now maybe this person has a different perception and, and you can completely nullify that negative energy. And again, it's still the same energy, mm -hmm. but now you've changed it and you've given it a positive spin and now it's back out into the world. And that's kind of like what you're doing through this slow mindset of like the form. And that's, it's training you to do that. And one of the key things that I was taught to do while doing the empty hand form and why to learn the martial aspect is that I was always taught to fight against an imaginary opponent, but that imaginary opponent was me, my biggest enemy, mm -hmm. everything I wanted to change, anything that like was confront, like anything that I was dealing with, if it was like, you know, sadness, pain, jealousy, like that is like emanate yourself into that, understand that person, that's who you're fighting. And again, but you're not looking to vanquish. You're looking to survive, to protect, to defend. And the way to defeat that enemy is to change that energy. So as they are giving you this negativity, as your own enemy, your own self is giving you this, take it in, change it around, 
use the movement to completely get rid of this mm. and respond and to change this energy. So now this enemy is not becoming your enemy. And you realize that like everything that you've put into this imaginary enemy, it's you. Mm. I, can't, I can't get rid of a lot of the faults that I have. I can work on them. They're a part of me though. But as long as I keep that idea of like, I can keep changing this. I can turn my weakness into my strength. And again, it's, it's not about being perfect. The, the, the beauty of human perfection is that we are imperfect and we have the ability to constantly grow, to constantly change, to learn things. But still understanding that like, we come from these backgrounds, we've had these experiences and these experiences we can use to strengthen ourselves. And that's what the form helps us to do in a more just like in a energy, spiritual, emotional, compassionate way. And, and again, it's through the martial aspect or the physical aspect that we understand of like controlling the breath. Because sometimes you have those experiences and like the first thing that happens is your shoulders lock up, <laughs> your chest gets tight. And when that happens, you create a lot of emotional stress and the brain starts thinking of like, <gasps> and you, it's, it's very reactionary. And like, <laughs> and that's when kind of your emotional state takes over, your emotions <laughs> take over. And I'm not saying emotions are bad. Cause like I said before, these are you it's like just energy. It's just energy. So what you learn to do is to relax the shoulders, relax the body and instead use your emotions as tools. Well, I think I think when people's shoulders go up and everything goes up, right? It's like we, as human beings, we have these tendencies to try to like figure something out, right? All the energy goes up into the head. So it's like, or between the heart and the head. And it's like, we fight ourselves, right? And yeah. we have these like different characters and different voices and we're like fighting ourselves in our own heads, trying to figure something out. And what a beautiful and profound way of doing practice to dedicate that your shadow side or any of those discomforts that you're experiencing to being this invisible opponent because then you can actually work with it and you can move that energy through your body so that you're not just sitting there trying to mentally figure it out which is impossible it's like you can never you can never figure anything out by figuring anything out anyway so like <laughs> might as well just like Start doing Tai Chi against it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, like, totally. And, and again, and it, it just helps. Because you, you have to change the form of it, right? Yeah, you totally You can't do. just perseverate on the same thing. You've got to change the form of it. You've got to change the form of it. Yeah. And, and, that's, and I think one of the hardest things, too, and it's, and it's something that I had to realize, too, it's like you have to be honest with yourself. Some, like, very, you have to be, you're being kind to yourself by being a little bit harder on yourself. Sometimes. vulnerable like, huh vulnerable humble yes, yes you 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 have to make yourself vulnerable um and sometimes it's even hard to do that to yourself and realizing that like i do these things this this is a trap that i allow myself to put myself into and again it's like i do it i do it to me like this is me doing this to me <laughs> right. like i got to stop this like you can't even blame it on somebody else even if somebody else is involved it's still like my shit is my shit your shit is your shit right exactly yeah and, and that's, that's, that's what the form has helped me to realize and, and help me to understand that. And, and it's still like at the bottom line of it too, is like, now that I understand that, like when I have new students, it's very easy to see when there's a discomfort, when their mind is wandering, when they're having a bad day, even, even when you're just talking to somebody, like the way they hold themselves, the way they talk, they may tell you one thing, but based on their eyes, the way that they're holding their body, their, their body language, it's like, you're going through something. And sometimes it's just like, hey, how's everything going? And then just be silent, be quiet, be, again, like the form, be motionless and also moving at the same time, just take everything in. And a lot of times they will tell you. And sometimes, you know, by having this insight that you create, you can be like, hey, well, maybe you should try this or you should try this and give them a different insight at the same time. So see, Tai Chi is not just based on like this, this fighting thing. Right. It's, it's a way to interact with everything. It's you're interacting with your environment. A lot of the, a lot of what I tell my students is I'm giving you tools to have a conversation with everything, to listen and not listen with your ears. You're listening with your whole body. You know, that's something that brings up something really interesting about Tai Chi as a practice to develop awareness because, you know, we, we, we typically have like, depending on how much we're in our heads, like a certain radius, like 
our aura size almost of how aware we are. So let's say we're like walking to our car outside, it's nighttime. Like, let's say someone with negative intentions is going to come up and attack us. Depending on where our head space is, our energy or awareness state is, will determine how quickly we'll know when, when that person got into our aura, right? So we might not know until they're like a few inches away. Or if we've developed this practice of really expansive awareness and listening with the whole body, we would know when he's like a block away, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You totally, yeah. That's and like, that's, yeah. I've noticed in this is, I mean, this is like a really silly example, but <laughs> even just like practicing Tai Chi, even just like practicing it once in the morning and then going to um, salsa dancing practice at night, I can feel the difference because salsa is also sort of like this meditative art mm -hmm. where you're, it's all improv and you're with another partner and you're just listening, especially as a follower, you're totally listening to where they want you to go. Mm -hmm. And you might be like putting your hands behind your back. People, they might be like grabbing something from behind your head. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that when I do Tai Chi often, like you know, get into my daily practice, I know exactly where I need to go and exactly what moment because I'm yeah. so in tune, not only with myself, but that other person and their intentions, I can feel their intention even before it happens in a sense. Yeah. 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 And, and, and with dancing, it's the same thing. And, and, and it's, you're kind of opening the same thing. Cause, and we talked about that vulnerability stuff and like, that's what it does. Like, especially when you're dancing somebody, like you are making yourself vulnerable, just like when you're doing the form and when you can control being vulnerable, but being relaxed at the same time, and again, it goes back into that making your weakness your strength. Vulnerability isn't a weakness. It's, it's a way to, again, take everything in. When you make yourself vulnerable, but you're still aware of your surrounding, you know, you can handle yourself, you can take care of yourself, but you're kind of opening yourself up to everything else that's going on. You're becoming more receptive to things. But because of your practice, you learn how that if something does come in, you can change it or you can have that sensation before something happens and then you can make the decision of like i need to get out of here or i need to take my step here or i need to move here or somebody's going to talk to you about something you're like oh i need to get on a, in a more aware state of like what they're going to say my mind needs to be very clear i need to be very exact because i can tell that this person is coming at me or they're about to come at me with like <clears throat> emotionally energetically yeah. emotional verbal ammo and so, yeah, it, it's, it permeates everything. Like this tai, tai Chi, it's, it's incredibly amazing. Like everything it can do, like anything in your life, it will help with, like across the board. And everybody, I mean, people who I've taught, even people who I haven't taught anymore, like I meet up with them and they'll even, they'll tell me the same thing. Like, like you, they'll have weird stories of that. Like I'll be at work and like, I felt something weird. Like I still do my practice. And before I knew it, like, I was stocking stuff and boxes were about to fall, but I didn't know it. And like, I got out of the way and be, like, and I did, you know, I didn't wave hands like clouds and I didn't know what I was doing. And like my hand went up to block and like went up to do this thing. I was like, yeah, like it's not just a martial art form in the sense of this. Like it's, it's just, it culminates to so much more, uh, which is why it would be nice if more people did it. <laughs> I know. I mean, it should be like, Everyone should be doing it. Every single person out there should be doing Tai Chi. Not not should, not in a, like a heavy should way, but just in terms of like, you know, if we're into acupuncture, we're into flower essences, we're into yoga, we're into meditation. It just seems to me like Tai Chi is a no brainer. But I yeah. think it's 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 hard to find a good teacher, right? Is it hard to find a good teacher in the other parts of the country? It is. It took me a while. Well, okay, for what I wanted to learn. It, it 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 was it was you know i right. i was very blessed to find my teacher like to give him the doors and to open, like to go through those doors and to 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 do, i i know that like i may not have like if i never moved out if i never took that advice from from songe like i may never have met gary mm -hmm. like i may never have had that connection again like oh, and it might you it may not may, have met your teacher your i teacher. may not have met my teacher I may not, and like I, I, I even got the experience to meet Master Nee through a Skype call, and like even meeting him. And even right now, I have a, uh, I met some, I'm meeting new friends. Like right now, I'm, I'm meeting a lot of different martial arts, and one of them is a friend that I met through Gary. His name is Master Lee, and 
And I, I just want to spar with some of his students. And, and, I, and I go to his class too. But he, even, he was even like, oh, no, no, you don't have to pay. Just come to my class. He's like, you're here for afterwards. I was like, no, no, no. Like, you're teaching a different style. He's like, you know the long form. He's like, you know it. You don't have to, you don't have to be here. But even him, like, he's decided to show me things and other students. Like, this kind of introduction to, like, a more traditional form is causing them to be like, I think we need to start something new. But he is so kind and so generous and so open. And like, again, this is another door that, again, if I hadn't have taken that advice, like, I wouldn't have met another teacher who's also so willing and open to teach. And that's one thing of looking for a teacher is somebody who you can see that spark in them, that like the idea and the prospect of a student who really wants to learn, like it'll ignite something in him. Like Gary, like Gary thought he was, yeah. And it was like, it was this fire that like grows. And I know that cause like I've gone through, you know, years of like, sometimes I'll have students and like, they'll, you know, they'll be, you know, they'll stick with me and they'll leave. And then, or they go on and off again sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> mm, not mentioning any names. No, <laughs> Some, no, somebody fallen off the wagon a couple times. <laughs> but, but you see, even those students, because when they come back, it's like they had an epiphany of something. Right. And, and they want to like learn something more. And it, it, it ignites something in you again. And like, it's like, and you can see it in the eyes. You can see it in their movement. And you can see it. You can hear it in their voice. And a good teacher will not want to hold anything back. And that's something Gary taught me. Because after I'd been practicing for a while, and he was like, yeah, you're into it. He's like, I am teaching you everything. He's like, I am not holding you back. He's like, you keep showing me you can progress. He's like, I will unlock everything for you. And same thing with Master Lee. Like, he's watching me. He's like, you have really good control. Like, you had a good teacher and you practice well. He's like, let me show you this. Like, I want to show you this. And, I, and like, at some point, like, he has all these weapons along the wall, and he's, like, very good at the rope dart, which is something I've always wanted to learn. And it's a very good, slowly, internal uh, weapon martial art. And there's pictures of him, and I was like, hey, like, I hear you're really good at the rope dart. He's like, oh, I haven't picked it up in years. I was like, can you still do it? He's like, oh, yeah, he's, like, second nature. And I was like, I always want to learn rope dart, and I always want to learn three-section staff. And he just pulled me aside, and he was like, grab, grab, grab a three-section staff right now, right now. And I was like, I was like, I, I, I just know a little bit of stuff. <laughs> feel it, feel it, like, move it. Let's see what you can do. And I was like, well, I can do this. He's like, okay, okay you still need to start on staff. He's like, but pick up a staff. And we had like a two hour class. Wow. He wanted to show stuff. And he grabbed other students and he was like, have I shown you the staff form yet? And they're like, you showed us like the first beginning parts, but nothing. he's like, no, no, everybody who's still here, pick up a staff. Come on. Let's And like, again, like that one thing ignited. It's like that traditional teacher student relationship where the teacher needs to be asked in order for it to like open that door or unlock that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's a combination of, of showing that first, that respect to right. your teacher. And he will show you that respect and right. also showing that like you are determined because right. to him, it's like, it's like this seed has been primed. This seed's been growing. Like this seed needs more stuff to let it grow. Like I, I, I need to let it grow. Like I need to give it the right things that it needs, that it needs to keep flourishing. And, and then it's, and then it's just second nature for him to be like, and let's do this and do this movement and incorporate that. And then and that teacher-student relationship is very important. And we were talking about lineage and like, and that's how the lineage like keeps alive. Like it's it's that respect and knowing your history. And and even though there are lineages, and this is one thing that will separate some schools, because some lineages are like, you learn my lineage. This is the lineage that we learn. And there's some schools that aren't like this. But one thing that even Master Lee, Gary, and Master Me taught me was like, you go out and you find other people. He's like, your form isn't complete. Your form is never complete. The only way your form is complete is if you make friends, learn new things, incorporate new forms, incorporate different martial arts, incorporate different practices of moving energy. But the only way you're gonna do that is if you are open to other people's martial art. Don't just mm -hmm. close yourself off to Tai Chi. He's like, this is your stepping stone. Look at their art always take in anything new and change it. And another good, any good teacher will tell you the same thing. They won't talk about how my, our art is the best. Gary would tell me, I love Tai Chi. Tai Chi Chuan, amazing, clear across the board. If you're looking to be good though, he's like, you have to go other places. He's mm -hmm. like, it's up to you as to how far you're going to take your form. 
it's not in the form where you're going to find the strength. It's in the skill of the person. And that skill of the person is determined to how open they are to take everything in and make it part of themselves. He's like, that's what Tai Chi is. That's what Kung Fu is. That's what, you know, the idea of, or Kung Fu, uh, the idea of like taking everything in, making it a part of yourselves. Well, then you make it alive and then it's not stagnant, right? And then this whole idea of the, the legacy of the student becoming better than the teacher, you, you do that because the practice is alive and malleable and changeable, right? Exactly. And it keeps changing and it keeps developing and it keeps learning new things. And, it, and at some point we learn the form so that we can become formless. And again, this goes in not just the practice of, you know, the martial aspect, the Tai Chi, but also in the aspect of ourselves. Like we have this thing to teach us all this stuff, to, to give us these references of like, well, this happens, this happens. But at some point we want to break that mold. We want to under, we want to break our boundaries. We want, we want to open things up. We want to take everything in, but we're now prepared for it. And so that way you can incorporate anything into your form. Make it make it you. Understand your connection with everything. That it's not just about this vessel here. Your vessel, as small as it is, and as insignificant and insignificant as you think it has, it has a profound effect on everything around you. People, the world the environment, everything, like if you have that intention, if you've been practicing to cultivate all this stuff, at some point you need to break out of that and re-emerge yourself into everything. And that's real Tai Chi. That's real Tai Chi. That's where you take it. And again, that's where you make it alive and new. And that way it's it'll never die. It'll never go away. Right. And then you don't, it's not like you get stuck in the 108 movements like, oh, I'm just going to do these 108 movements. Yeah. I mean, if you just did that every day until the day you die, it'd still be a good thing. But yeah, you can incorporate different kinds of things in the in the form to keep it fresh. Yeah. So talk a little bit about people who know me know that I love teachers who have or practitioners or healers who have taught or practiced something for themselves for a significant amount of time before teaching others to you know, know really deeply the effects that it has on one's own body. You know, it's also sort of like Dr. Heal Thyself first. Do you have any, you, anything you want to say about that? Or like, you know, did you have any thoughts in the beginning about how long you practiced for before you began to teach? I, I never had the idea of teaching at first. Mm -hmm. And even when I started getting better at it, you know, pretty good in like, you know, was, even Gary was saying things and certain people and other people who were doing Tai Chi, they would see me, they would be like, you should teach. And like, to me, I, it was like not in my head to mm -hmm. me. I wanted, cause I wanted to perfect it. Right. I wanted to have a clear understanding of everything. Cause if I was going to correlate it to somebody, I needed to tap into them, which means I needed to tap into myself at the same time. Because if there, if there is an instance where they were having problems or an issue with a certain movement, I needed to be able to understand that. And a lot of times it's not just the physical aspect. It's a mental and emotional aspect of like why you can't get this form. And so I had to work on that. I had to understand that for myself. And I was even, I was even told like, well, if you practice, like if you show, teach them the form, like it's just good for them to, to learn the form too. And to me, it was like, yes, I understand that. It's like, but... I don't want to cheat anybody that I'm teaching. Like, I want to make sure that when I impart it into them, it's everything. And again, and that, that takes also understanding of like what this person is going through, mm -hmm. what they're trying to go through. And again, like, but I, that means like I had to break down my walls completely, rebuild them up. And, and that's one of the things I did through one of our practices. It's like, I had to realize what kind of person do I want to be? Mm -hmm. Like, how, like, how do I want to carry myself? If I want to be this person that wants to help people, that wants to teach, there is a, I, I have to hold myself in a certain way to not just, and then it wasn't a respect out of me, like having self-respect, it's like to have respect for my teachers, to have respect for my form, to have respect for my parents, most of all, but to have respect for the student that I was going to teach, whether it was going to be a student that was just going to be there for one lesson or that was going to be there for, uh, with me for a lifetime. Like I needed to work on this and make sure that I knew everything about it so that I gave them my utmost respect mm -hmm. when they gave me their time. So that way they also understand that like my time is precious because your time is precious. 
And we both know there isn't a lot of time for us on this earth. <laughs> Life is short. I'm so, so sure. So I like, and so by taking, you know, taking my time to, you know, really perfect everything, it allows me to like really designate my time for the students. And that's what's really important to me. And once that kind of clicked, it was like, okay, now I want to teach. But at the same time, like I said, like, and then you find those students and like, you see the movements and like, you see them getting it and it really like ignites you again. And again, it's, it's taken that time for taking so long to perfect this thing. Cause you know, everything that they're going to go through, you know, the hardships of the practice and, you know, you can tell them or when you need to, you can be hard on them and you can tell them, you know, sometimes like you're doing it wrong. <laughs> stop doing it wrong. I know when you're not practicing, stop lying to me about not practicing. I know that right now that you are stressed out and you are hiding something. I need you to let that go. Or at the same time, you know when to raise them up, when to bring them up, that you can see like they need a little bit of push. They need more positive side of it, like a more comforting side. And that just comes along with your own practice of learning it for so long. Again, it's learning yourself. And by learning yourself and again, breaking those walls down, seeing that invisible enemy of yourself, which is really yourself, you understand everybody has this. And it helps in teaching better. It helps in being honest and genuine with the teaching practice. At least that's what I have found. So when, when you say that your students, you know what kind of challenges your students are going to go through? Hmm. Are you referring to like facing your own inner shadow demons, your own inner stuff? Or what are you talking about? It's that. It's facing your own inner demons. It's going through the hard times. Sometimes your body doesn't do what you want it to do. You haven't learned that yet. You're still training. There's certain parts of the body that, you know, that in your head, it's like, I want to do this, but my left hand just like flaps around wildly. <laughs> it's like, it's like I want to do this movement, but like, I always, it looks like, you know, like I'm injured. <laughs> it looks like I'm injured and like I'm having such a hard time. But that can also correlate to what's happening emotionally. Oh and, my God. Yeah, totally it all connects together. Like it all goes together. And like, and sometimes like when I see certain students having an issue, it's like, what, what's going through your head? I'm like, you don't have to tell me what's going through your head. I'm like, but you're stressed out about something. There's something in your mind right now that you are working through. And a lot of them will be like, no, I'm fine. I'm just tired. It's like, <laughs> you're not just tired. I'm like, if you're tired, there's a reason why you're up at night, while you're keeping yourself up at night. There's a reason why before you go to bed, you can't shut off that switch and you're running scenarios in your head. There's something you're holding on to, like, and you don't have to tell me about it, but you need to realize it. You need to face it in your practice. Like you need to let it become a part of you. Stop trying to, you know, skirt it off away. Like be aware, be here, be present and understand that this is in front of you. And this is what we're working with Mm. because it's all part of the practice. That's why I'm teaching you to breathe, to be aware to move so slowly, to move so softly, to take everything in, to take in the good, to take in the bad. That's not uh, easy. And, and everybody's going to go through those hardships. And, and, and in any practice, any practice that anybody is going to put themselves into. And I'm sure with dancing, you did this too, because a lot of things are going to come up. Uh, well, I noticed too, I noticed one thing I did notice with both Tai Chi and dance is that the way I operate in life is how I move. So, oh God, it would just piss me off. I mean, now I'm just a little more self-compassionate about it and really just observe it and see when I do it. But it's like overdoing it, like going the extra mile. It's going to be like the best. And because you want to do so well, like overextending everything, trying too hard and everything. So that comes out in dance, it comes out in Tai Chi, that comes out in the movie. It literally comes out physically in the overextension, like overextending the body. Yeah. So yeah, you you see that come out in your body. And I have, I mean, I have seen that also in your practice. Like I can tell the overextension, you can see it. And again, like I can, I can tell when, when you've overextended yourself, even energy wise, like just like, I can just see you for five seconds, like walking from one room to the next and the way you're holding yourself. (laughs) Yep. Like she needs to relax or she's going to, she's going to, her body's going to tell her like, nope, (laughs) you're done for right now. (laughs) Your body will do that to you. Your body at some point, like, and I've done it too. And and, and I still do it too. And like, I will overexert myself in my practice sometimes because I still want, it's like, it's like just another hour, just another hour of this. And even though like I'm taking it relaxed, like, again, 
the body has limits. The body has a toll, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it can even toll on emotionally because like, and, and, and even as somebody who's been doing it as long as I am, and I want to keep perfecting myself for my students, I always need to make sure that there's a balance. Because mm-hmm. if I over practice, I, I drain my body. And if I drain my body, my, the lessons are going to go as well as, or I, or I need to cancel a lesson because like physically I can't be there. Cause like I work too hard and like, yeah. you know, even though my, I know my body's okay. It's like, my body's also telling me <laughs> because I'm so aware of it, it's like, you do a little bit more, like you will be done. You, you mean like last week when you canceled on me cause your ribs were bruised cause you were sparring. <laughs> that's not, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, things like that. Yeah, that, that brings me to the next question, which is, you know, just like a, a and we're, we're coming close to the end, but just a quick thing about, you know, what happens when you spar with folks? Because most people think of Tai Chi, right, as a slow, flowy thing. And then you go into these like MMA gyms or you go into these, you know, studios with karate, Jiu Jitsu, Aikido, Wing Chun, Taekwondo. Like, how, how, how does your Tai Chi practice fare with all of these other martial artists? Pretty well so far. Now, I have been lucky to make friends with different martial artists of different backgrounds that understand that as sparring is not fighting, we are not tournament fighting. Right. We are working to increase our skill, yep. increase our understanding of another person. And again, sparring becomes very intimate in that, in that sense. Mm-hmm. You're letting a lot of vulnerability down. There's a role too in sparring, which is you reserve the strength, but not the skill. So like I can speed up a punch. I can get very close. Like I can hit somebody with the same speed, with the same intensity, but without the power because I don't want to hurt them. Right, right. And so they do the same. And a lot of us is just testing that. Now, Tai Chi with a lot of... Now, again, I was taught full martial form. I was taught and like... And that's why I'm sparring because I want to see like how, how well it fares. And again, it's been well because... If I'm going against like a regular, like a, any other Chinese martial arts fighter, Taekwondo, uh, that type of fighting, they notice exactly what the form is, is that if they have a punch coming at me, I'm deflecting and I'm attacking at the same time. If they're moving in, I am moving to the side and also moving in. I am, you're flowing, you're, you're manipulating. You're like water. It's like water. If they try to hit me, I can take that in and I can move it around. Uh, one guy tried to trip me and instead, like, I matched my ground and I turned his ground into mine. And I completely just folded backwards as he tried to actually, like, backwards take an arm bar across my chest. And he thought he had me and he was going to knock me down. What happened instead is that as he started to push me down, I locked into one of his legs, grounded, folded, was able to flip my arm and grab him and get on his inside. Mm-hmm. And again, like, most people who don't know fighting, they'd be like, I don't know what you just said, but either way, like <laughs> sounded good. <laughs> yeah, it sounded good. But and it's it's nice for me because like I've never really sparred before, but doing this, it's really cool. And some people ask, like, well, what about like jujitsu and like grappling stuff and ground stuff? And now any Chinese martial art is based upon a solid ground foundation. We can get low to the ground and still keep our form. That doesn't mean that we're not invulnerable to grappling we have to practice for it we have to practice ground techniques we have to practice being put in a chokehold and a lot of our standing movements when taught right you learn how to get out of those chokeholds and so now those it is taking time because i have to let them get me in the chokehold get me down on the ground and then i have to figure out what in my form will let me lock out of this if something that i know isn't working the people I've been practicing with are kind enough to be like, well, maybe you should try this. And like, usually we do this where we break out of this lock. And so I will take that again into my own form and see where there's a similarity in the form that I know and be like, Hey, this is like this, but they taught me to do it like this. So maybe I should overextend my arm or maybe I should pull in close to my body and grappling closer. And so it's become an eye opening experience in like, First of all, it is a fighting art. Like it can be, but mm-hmm. like all my teachers have said, like it's up to you and what you take in. And luckily, I've been, I've been again 
very fortunate to have met people that are willing to work with me. It's like they want to see this succeed too, even though they come from different martial arts. And they, they like the idea of like, hey, here's this guy who like wants to learn anything, <laughs> anything new. And like when I go in there, I feel like I have this little kid expression. They're like, well, you want to start with me? Well, first I have to teach you like rolling techniques and ground falling and like anti-lock. And like, I'm like, cool. Yeah. Like, when do we start? Like, throw me around. I don't care. Like, <laughs> like do all this to me. It's, it's great. There's actually one guy who was an MMA trainer that didn't want to fight. He didn't want to spar with me. And, and he didn't have a lot of time, but he was just like, and we had, you know, there's friends around, like they knew me that I did Tai Chi. They knew he did mixed martial arts and he was visiting from Kansas and they're like, Hey, you guys do martial arts. You should spar. And he asked me, what martial art do you do? And I said, I do a traditional form of Tai Chi Chuan. And he looked at me and he knew what Tai Chi Chuan was. And he was like, how long is your form? And I said, I do the 108. He says, I don't want to fight you. And everybody was like, why? He's like, he already won. And again, I had never been sparring. And like, I, I, I had never, you know, dealt with anybody like this before. But they asked him like, why? Why don't you want to fight him? And, and he was the one who kind of opened my eyes to this. And this was like about seven years ago. But he was like, my martial art, like, I like to get people on the ground. I need to ground them because I'm about locking, choking out, doing all this stuff and, like, trying to, like, arm bar and stuff. Like that. He's like, I know how to do a straight-up fight. He's like, first of all, in, in a stand-up fight, he likes to close distance. So whatever I do, he's going to close that distance. If I throw a punch at him, he's going to deflect and he's going to have a hit ready for me. My art is punch, then block, or attack, then block. It's like his art knows how to do both at the same time. The other thing his art teaches him is how to be grounded, which means he knows how to move and position his body where if I try to grapple him, he will find a way to throw me or to move my energy. So no matter what I try to do to grapple him, he'll find a way to maneuver himself around it and I'll find myself either on the floor or on the opposite side of him. He's like, I, and I think he dealt with a Tai Chi master before because the way he talked about it was like, I don't want, he's like, he's like it'd be fun he's like but he already won like that's it like his his form teaches him to do something that you know kind of trumps my form in certain aspects of it and and again it's true to an extent because i have met grapplers that have still managed to take me down and again their skill though their skill set they have stacked up their skill set on in that sense and again that that shows like whatever fighting art you want to do again it's up to your skill level it's not up to that form because a lot of these guys who when i spar with them and they do get the upper hand on me they're guys who just don't do brazilian jiu-jitsu they also know wing chun they also know hungar kung fu system they know taekwondo they know karate they know they all there are also these guys that like i love martial arts i love all this stuff and i've incorporated it into <laughs> And I think that's why we've like we kind of mesh together so well because like we, we have this mentality of like I love martial arts like I love kung fu like I love this. So for p other people who are in love with martial arts, no matter what form the the form is, I just want to throw in there that you're starting this new project that I'm super excited about at the Film Bar in Phoenix, Arizona. Yes. Talk a little yeah. about your project. I'm also excited about it, and it's something that I wanted to do a while ago, but it seems like things are working better now and the uh the camaraderie amongst everybody and so what it is it's uh it's it's pretty much a kung fu movie night like the film bar they they show a lot of like indie films and art house films and they can license a lot especially like the old kung fu movies or or any martial art movie as long as the licensing is easy and i've always wanted to bring martial artists together but also people who just love kung fu movies because like my friend who showed me the first movie he wasn't into martial arts the way i am but he right. loved asian cinema he loved everything about it and also one thing that anybody who does martial arts and wants to teach one of the biggest goal is like how do i get other people interested in this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like like how can i show them or how can we bring it to the public because right. like I can do a lot of uh, demos at different places, but the people going to those demos are people who know about martial arts and they right. want to see martial arts. I've tried doing it at a farmer's market before and it's really early in the morning and people think it's cool or not, but like you're at a farmer's market to do a lot of shopping for other stuff. And so I would get people that stood there for like five seconds and like, <laughs> that's nice. Then they walk away. <laughs> they, don't, they don't get the full aspect of it. Right, so, right. If, you know, so we're, our plan is to have, you know, hopefully like once a month, 
an old Kung Fu movie or any Kung Fu movie and to have a master or a student who has been doing a form that is showcased in that movie and give a brief interview about not just their schooling, not just their background, but about the form and also an insight to, again, the lineage of the history of that form based on that movie and possibly also doing demonstrations of their form and like what you're going to see and like, so that way, when you see that form, you're like, oh yeah, they, they just talked about that. And like, that's all that. Or like, and even just knowing insights of like certain key elements of the movie. Like, you know, the first movie I hope to do is 36 Chambers of Shaolin, which I actually am talking to a Shaolin monk who has a school here, Woo! like tremendously nice. And he is like, he was also like so into it. Like once I talked to him about that, he like, like his eyes lit up. He's like, oh, this is a great idea. Like, this is cool. Uh, like, I love to do this. This is so great. And he'll give insight into, like, more of, like, what Shaolin is. And he's yeah. a real Shaolin monk from China. Yeah, yeah, he he's a real, like, you see him, and, like, yeah, you can tell. Like, he has that build of, like. Who'd like, have guessed we've had a Shaolin monk in Phoenix? <laughs> yeah, I, I never knew. I Funny thing is, like, I actually, I have performed with Shaolin monks before at the fair. And they're nice people, but I didn't know like they were here in Phoenix. I thought they were like a traveling group because I've always seen them in traveling groups. It wasn't until recently where I've been looking for these teachers who are willing to be part of this pro this this project. Where I was like, well, I want to do this first movie because it was a movie that started everything for me. And I was like, and I know there's people who do the Shaolin forms. And so that's the first people I looked into. And one thing I never thought of typing in was Shaolin, just Shaolin Monastery in Phoenix. And I typed that in and it was like, the Shaolin Association of Phoenix. And I was like, what is this? And so I click on it. I was like, this guy's a monk. Like, and like that this school was started by his abbot. And he, wow. te he teaches in Chandler. And I was like, I got to meet this guy. Like, I have to go meet this guy. And so, um, which is another funny thing is like most martial artists, their web presence is almost non-existent. <laughs> find out about me, if, they, if anybody listening to this, they try to find out about me, like, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Right. And a lot of the teachers that I have been introduced to and that I have been meeting, it's the same way. Like they might have a website. It's the secret underground. <laughs> you have to know the right people. You have to know the right people, which again, by doing this Kung Fu movie night and having these, you know, these right. teachers that are promoting their school, it's giving them an outlet and an outlet that's very comfortable. Cause again, cause if they're a lot like me, like the whole internet thing is it's, it's a little weird for us. And a lot of, like, for me, my, my personal experiences, like, I have tried doing, uh, you know, Facebook, webpage, Instagram, all that stuff to try to get people within my area involved. And I get people who want to do it, but they're not in Phoenix. And it's like, sorry, buddy, I don't, I don't live in Nebraska. Like, you can find a teacher there, but, and the, but they have trouble finding a teacher where they're from. And there may be a great teacher in Nebraska, but it's hard to find that person. And so people here in Phoenix, they may have heard about, you know, these martial arts and they want to do them, but they don't know where to go. Or it's like, well, the only, the only school I know of is this one school that teaches when I work. Like my work schedule it doesn't coincide. Right, with right, right. So, if, you know, if we have this thing where people can, you know, see the teachers, talk to them afterwards probably because, you know, if you're talking martial arts, if you're like me, like, like this conversation, like this conversation could actually go on like probably for like four hours if we wanted to get in. <laughs> and all of them are the same way. And before you know it, like it'll probably even be like, well, let me go outside and show you some things. And that's what they want to do. Like they just, they just love it so much. They just want to tell everybody about it. And so it's going to give people that, uh, that area, that place to where they can probably find somebody, their teacher. Well, and, and how cool is that, 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 you know, you, you see the movie on the big screen and then you meet somebody who who actually really practices that. It's not just like, oh, that's just a movie that they trained for and they know a couple moves. That's like Bruce Lee. Like Bruce Lee actually was a freaking incredible master. And so you watch yeah. the movie on the big screen and then you actually get to meet a few real masters like yeah. right there. You can right touch there. them. Yeah, like they can do that. Like you can put in the screen. <laughs> that guy right there, he can do that. <laughs> he can do all that cool stuff. And yeah, like, and it's, and yeah, and it's kind of like, it's, where like most things where you find out about like the background to some movies, like sometimes it can disillusion the, 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 the magic of a movie. To me, being able to have that there, that reference of like, no, that no, magic's real. 
that's real. It's like, no, like it, it'll enhance like the magic of that movie of like, especially like old movies. Cause now like everybody is like, they're used to like, if they've seen newer Kung Fu movies, like there's a lot of wire work. There's a lot of CGI. If you watch the older movies, like a lot of those sequences, you notice they do not cut frame for like about eight minutes. Then eight, that's eight minutes of these guys, even though they have trained not to hit each other, like they may have hit each other before. Right. That are they are so trained where like they've taken this incredibly hard fight sequence and they they are doing it perfectly. And every move that you see is doing is done so well because every movie, especially in an old Shaw Brother movie, all those guys were trained as little kids to do martial arts, and they wanted to do martial arts, and they they were given a facet of like, hey, it's not the old times where like you know it's hard to find schools, it's hard to find teachers, it's it's hard to find people who want to learn. But these people want to hire us to do movies where we get to fight all day. We get to live out our dream of, of living in, in a feudal China where, you know, <laughs> we have you know, our classical style of outfits. And, you know, even though I'm not a Shaolin monk, I can, I'm in a movie where I train like a Shaolin monk and I can put everything that my teachers taught me. And now it's on a big screen and people can see what, you know, Kung Fu is and how it pertains to life. And, and that's one of the, the magics of like those movies is that like, there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. And like the good guy is always like this outstanding individual. Like he is somebody who is also going through something. They have to go through something and they're not just overcoming, like learning a new form. They're overcoming something that is troubling them that they need to overcome to progress. So last question for you. They, they, I've heard you say throughout our conversation, um, two words pretty repetitively. One is meditative and soft. And so as, when you're meeting all of these other masters and you come back and you tell me like how meditative and soft they are, do you think that's because they had to face their, their inner challenges? Yes, very much. And talking to them, it's almost like it's unspoken that we, it's an understanding because, you know, you give your salute, you say hello. And as soon as like you start talking, it's, it's like you're running into an old friend again like you know what you've been through like it's like hey i've been doing this for for 15 years and it's like i've been doing this for 30 years and it's like and i'm sure just within that talking and, and like we talk about our love of this like going through our head is like all of our teachers every time that like our teachers threw us around or like we stood out for like an hour in horse stance or we did this but with that also goes along again all that internal struggle all that emotional stuff and so like you're kind of meeting up with like a fellow it's again it's a friend it's a family mother it's, it's a brother or a sister that you're meeting with again and it's like it just connects and how nice that you can bring together all the martial artists in phoenix and not have it be like a, oh this form is better than that form or this form from japan is better than that one and Ch from china like that whole yeah. unify everybody together and that's that's the goal that's the goal it's it's not to keep the school separate not to keep the form separate it's not to make people think that like, I learned this, this is better. I learned this, this is better. It's like, no, martial arts in general, like not even Chinese martial arts, like Taekwondo, Jiu Jitsu. If you learn Jiu Jitsu and like, especially like Gracie Jiu Jitsu, like they don't want to be in a fight. They do not want to be in a fight. It, it's learned that, you know, it's taught that like, this is to protect myself. Like I can handle myself, but the best fight, the best fight I can get into is one where I don't have to fight. It's one where I don't hurt anybody or one where I don't get hurt or one where nobody gets hurt. That's the best fight ever, ever. And anybody who is really into the martial art aspect of it will tell you the same thing. It's not about like punching. It's like, no, it's, you know, it's even as a swordsman, as a swordsman, the best time that I use my sword is when I don't have to use my sword. Right. My sword does not want to leave. It's, it's sheath. It's just a way of life. It is. Yeah. My sword uses me to help me hone my heart, my compassion. And other than that, it, that's all it wants to do. If it has to protect me, it will, and it'll work together. But yeah, like, yeah, it's amazing. It's, it's amazing to have this opportunity and that they've been so open that they want to do this. And like, and I can't wait for it to happen. And, and I, you know, and I'm sure the people who want to come, like, they'll be pleasantly surprised. I have never seen a Kung Fu movie on a big screen. Like, an Ooh, so exciting. So oh my God. I'm sure anybody who comes and sees me, like, the awe I'll, I'll probably look like an eight-year-old kid like yeah. at the cinema again for the first time like watching all my heroes wow 
we need to figure out how to do some tea ceremonies with flower essences in the in the cafe part of the movie theater that'd be great yeah that'd be great because like and like uh that was one of the things too like meeting that shaolin monk like that's what he did like he did like and i've heard of like the tea ceremony and like it was so traditional even though like you know we're in the western side and like i was just in like a regular t-shirt and jeans and he was in his like his his student gear which was like a white t-shirt his kung fu pants and like his feiwei shoes his martial arts shoes and like he brought me in we saluted each other very quiet and as we're just getting to know each other he is getting the tea ready pouring it out making sure it's clean getting the hot water and the whole process pouring me you know waiting for me to take that first drink and then as i take that <laughs> drink he takes the drink and then we just talk and like again but like it's that com- camaraderie that was there it was that connection was there and it was like everything was open and again even though we both trained to like do things it's like none of that mattered what mattered was like as soon as I told him what I wanted to do with this project, he, he was like, I love this. I love it. And I was like, mm-hmm. there's other schools that I want to get involved. Like, not just your school. I was like, and maybe at some point we can be on a panel where it's like, it's different martial artists. And we talk about a movie that has in court. And he's like, oh yeah. He's like, that sounds great. That sounds amazing. He's like, you let me know. He's like, you email me and you just tell me. I was like, awesome. <laughs> was, and, and every one of the teachers who I've asked has been the same way. Like they love the idea and the film bar, especially. And it happened, it was very uh, serendipitous because the owner is also a Kung Fu fan. They all are, they all love. And like, we, we actually got into a conversation of like our favorite, like Kung Fu movies. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, let me interject here. Okay, so you're starting in May at the film bar. You're gonna have a May-ish. month. Mayish, okay, May. We're gonna have a monthly Kung Fu movie series or martial arts movie series, bringing in these amazing martial artists as speakers to pair together with the movies hopefully yes. some tea ceremonies and flower essences if we can we can if we can collaborate on it and then so we'll put all that information on the blog post of this podcast interview for the folks who are not in phoenix maybe it's time to take a trip out to phoenix okay but not in june july or august so if you are in phoenix you can grab the info at the film bar or on the podcast interview page but can you just give like three titles don't like don't don't give away the whole story just like yeah. three movies just for people three. in other parts of the world that they mm-hmm. yeah like the your best three movies that folks should start with and why so i will i, I will say for those who can make it to the first show you're in phoenix watch 36 chambers of Shaolin. which you said in the united states is called what is a really funny title so you'll find it too right now well now you can actually find it as the 36 chambers of Shaolin. Okay. If you can't find it, that the the other title is Shaolin Master Killer, which is very unrepresentative. Of what <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an Americanized title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was like you know the whole like yeah, was, yeah. You know, Jeff's position was out. Yeah, and again, you heard me talk about that one and, and how amazing it is. Not only that, Gordon losing it, he's been a, a he's been in a lot of movies. Uh, if, if you don't know who I'm talking about, he played Pai Mei in Kill Bill Volume 2. He was also in Kill Bill Volume 1 as one of the uh, Crazy 88 members. He's a bald guy that she actually has to face at the end before BB fights Ocean, uh, Oshiren, I think that's her name. As you can tell, I do watch a lot of Kung Fu movies to know like a lot of those references like that, but good one. And that way, if you ever see Gordon Liu's face again, any movie he's pretty much been in like in that era, like you'll love. Enter the Dragon is a staple that everybody I think should watch because it really did change a lot for Kung Fu cinema and also just for the Asian culture. And again, watching Bruce Lee and understanding that everything in that movie that he did was him. Like he dedicated himself to martial arts. He was so badass. He was. And and his background actually is in Wing Chun as well as Tai Chi and Judo and Aikido and Japanese martial arts. He was one of those guys that like took a lot of martial arts and what he knew and he made it his own art. Like Mm -hmm. talking about like, you know, people who actually do that and understand like the beautifulness uh, or the beauty and taking in all these things, like he did it and he did it masterfully. And that's a great showcase of like to see that. And also it's a great story. Like, and also if, if anybody out there is like a gamer fan and like you've ever played like, of course, like Mortal Kombat or Street Fighter or anything like those, like, <laughs> like a, lot, a lot of them will be like, 
so this movie was like made us want to do that and, and like whether well, like like we're not going to get into like the whole bias and like video games and stuff like that but again as for like people who are fans of like you know the fighting aspect of fighting movies like this was like enter um, the dragon yeah enter the dragon and then only one more you gotta more. you and gotta narrow it as i know it's so hard to like, you know, but if if i have to say one i will say just because it's this guy is like close to my heart so return of the drunken master which is with jackie chan now there's two reasons so jackie chan amazing now uh so I am gonna throw in like a an extra movie. Oh, in okay, 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 okay. So watch Drunken Master first, which is the first one where you'll see a young Jackie Chan, which amazing at drunken style. Like everybody knows him for like some of his acrobatic movies that he does, but Jackie Chan is one of the people who still does drunken style, like the old traditional style. And for folks who aren't um, familiar with martial arts, the drunken style would be like literally you're moving like a drunk man, but yeah. you're. Yeah, it's, and, it's and you like you're like you're like you're stumbling, but you have complete control over everything. And watching him in Drunken Master and Return of the Drunken Master is amazing. Like it's just it's just great, and it's fun. It's a fun movie. Now, Return of the Drunken Master, like it brings his character back again, and it also has a lot of different martial artists in there. There's actually a very cool scene with a Taekwondo fighter at the very end, which is cool to see again a Taekwondo fighter against the drunken master or uh, Jackie Chan's character in that movie. But, and I will probably get his name wrong because there's a lot of different names for this one actor in the movie that's in return of the return of the drunken master. And he plays like a, a guy that Jackie Chan's character meets and everybody, like when you see him, you'll know him. He's wearing like a furry hat and he has like a certain birthmark on his forehead and I don't want to, you know, butcher his name, but this guy, his drunken form, he doesn't do it in this movie, but this guy, like, he's it. Like, he's one of the, he was one of the last guy, like, masters of the drunken form. And he was actually Gordon Liu's teacher. So, like, it kind of goes full circle of, like, of, like, how these, all these guys are introduced. But watching Jackie Chan with one of the oldest school traditional martial artists that became famous through these movies, like, in a movie like, it's it's again it's cinema magic it's a milestone of like these two genres these two different you know ages of martial artists meeting together one last question and that is are these three movies relatively older like have you are there any like super modern say it came out in the last five ten years movies that you would recommend that i would recommend uh, so all these movies are older all these movies are i think between like late 70s or early sure. 70s and classics 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 these are classics if you're looking for something newer I, I mean i would always recommend like a lot of the any of the Ip Man movies but if they were going to watch any of the Ip Man movies i would say the beginning or if it's the i think it's Ip Man, the beginning or something like that like the grandmaster i have to look it up and any movie with jet lee uh every movie with jet lee <laughs> no uh tai chi actually jet lee does a movie called the tai chi master which you can find as a Tai Chi Master, which actually has Michelle Yeoh in it, which uh, people will know her as one of the actresses in Crouch, Tiger, Hidden Dragon. She's been in a lot of, a lot of movies. But that- I love Jet Li. He's so amazing. He is very amazing. And his, his Bakwa style, his Tai Chi style is amazing. Like, which is actually really funny if anybody does come to any of the Phoenix, the film bar things, events that we're going to have at some point i do have to have master lee which is one of the new teachers who has been teaching me and i hope to have him for a jet lee movie because master lee trained with jet lee when they were both kids they started from the same school they they grew up together and it, and right around the time that jet lee was becoming famous he moved to america he moved to arizona to come to school at asu and he just ended up staying here and has created his own wushu academy but hopefully master master lee We'll have a lot of stories about Jet Li. They share the same surname, but they're not related. Like, <laughs> um, wow, they're not awesome. related by blood, only only by brother brotherly martial arts and stuff like that. Uh, they'll be able to hear a lot of stories about that. Very cool. I, I I don't know any of these. I'm really looking forward to all these classics because I haven't seen the classics. But yeah. I I recommend any movie with Jet Li. He's so yeah. good. Uh, but really quick, going back to that Ip, Ip Man movie, it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's like Ip Man, the beginning of the Grandmaster, or Ip Man, the Grandmaster beginnings. Now, the reason to watch that, especially for people who are getting more into Wing Chun, is 
and people who are fans of Bruce Lee. So Bruce Lee's teacher was Ip Man, of course. In that movie, Ip Man, of course, his son is in that movie. <laughs> Ip Chun is in that movie, and you uh-huh. actually see his Wing Chun, which was taught by his dad. Like, so like again, it's a like to see that. Like for me, it's like oh my god! Like when I saw that the first time, I was like oh my god, there he is! Like real, you know, real masters. Real Not masters exactly. doing doing their form and like being so small and like being able to like still keep up with like all these young people and it's like wow like that's so cool but yeah so I would recommend any of those movies and and if you're like me you'll get addicted and you'll just you can't you can't stop <laughs> cool well, I'm so much looking forward to the film bar series that you're starting super stoked we're gonna put all the links to the movies in the in the in the podcast blog post so as we wrap up is there any last little something that comes to mind, piece of wisdom or advice that you often find giving people? I mean, be honest with yourself, be genuine, be natural, find your balance. Try not to be so hard on yourself. Find out where, you know, when you're going through something, understand, you know, it's coming from somewhere, but it's a part of you, you know, make it work, make it, make it make you stronger. Don't let it completely take you over. Like that's what a martial arts is. Like, you know, we understand that we have weaknesses, but we are, they make us strong. They make us who we are, as well as every interaction with everybody that we meet. Every interaction is beneficial and you should be grateful for it. Just like you should be grateful about this life and this body. Because through it, we can do so many, so many beautiful things. Awesome. And well, before I forget, if this goes out in time, April 28th, World Tai Chi Day or National Tai Chi Day. Actually, it's World Tai Chi Day. So if any of you are looking for a Tai Chi teacher, go online and just type <laughs> in World Tai Chi Day, your city, and you will find a list of people mm-hmm. teaching Tai Chi in a huge scale. And so that way, if you are interested in Tai Chi, what better way than meeting with a whole bunch of other people to do it? And it may just be a small form. You may find your teacher. You may find somebody else who can lead you to a different teacher. And that way you can actually just appreciate it and understand it. But April 28th, it's the last Saturday of April. So get online, do your thing and do Tai Chi and just, just enjoy it. Fabulous. Thank you so much for being with us, Frank. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's been, it's been awesome. (laughs) And if you are listening from an area that's near New York City, we are doing a flower flash mob on May 20th in New York City. Yeah, you can find the secret location on Instagram. Super excited about that. And if you are anywhere near Chicago on June 15th, we're doing another flower lounge event with a flower flash mob the following day. So join us at, in person at one of those events. Hopefully we can get Frank and his Tai Chi classes involved in our retreats and workshops in the future. And again, thank you for listening to the Flower Lounge. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.